Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. If you're paying attention, you know that you only make money when you work. It might be great money, but it's dependent on you. The information on this podcast will help you solve that. We interview experts and provide analysis into financial freedom through commercial real estate. Why? To help physicians like you thrive. Let's dive in. Hi, this is Dr. Michael McDennis, and welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. Today, we're going to be talking about finding and evaluating potential sponsors. Uh, So let's dive into a little more detail on the pros and cons of using online platforms versus individual syndicators in your real estate investing. So the online platforms, these are things like crowdsource and equity multiple, and there's some other ones out there. So one of the pros of these is deal uh, access. The online platforms aggregate a variety of real estate deals, providing investors with a range of options to diversify their investment portfolios. So you're just going to see a larger deal flow. Often they'll also have lower minimum investments for individual syndicators due to their cost structure and being smaller. The smaller the number of investors they have in one deal, the lower their expenses will be. So they will prefer a higher minimum uh, for each investor so that they can have fewer investors in the deal. On the other side, with the bulk deals that online platforms are doing, sometimes that allowed them to lower their minimum investments and make it easy to get started. Um, You know, the plus and minus of this, like I said, is easier to get started with the online platform and with lower investments. As you get to know the space, as you learn, allow you to maybe make some mistakes at a lower price. But as you move along and you start to want to, I I think, decrease the work. If you're evaluating fewer sponsors, when you find sponsors you like, uh, then it's not as much work to have to learn about the sponsor. Or With online platforms, you may be learning about the sponsor each time versus if you find an individual sponsor that you like, you can invest with outside of the platform. You can do repeat deals with them, and it's less work to evaluate them each time. Um, Transparency and the information involved. Online platforms typically are very good at giving detailed information, some historical uh, performance data, documentation. This also helps that you have the the people who set these platforms up have significant experience, experience So there's an alignment of interest there that they want to have good deals on their platform that bring people back. So you get a little help vetting the sponsors and the deals, and you know it's going to be more transparent. I think if you don't know the sponsor well and you haven't spent the time getting to know the sponsor, you have somebody else helping vet them for you. The process with an online platform if you're new, it, it, it's a little more streamlined because you, you've kind of put all your information in the system and it's there to just click, click, go. Any more, though, with individual sponsors, very few of them are working on the old model where you send them a check. Most individual sponsors will be using an online platform that it's going to be just the same as far as the automation and technology. So you know, historically, this was has been a reason that the online platforms have been better, but that's kind of gone away and technology has been democratized, making it easier for sponsors to use the same technology. Some of the reasons against using the bigger platforms is less control and less feedback. One of the things that sponsors get out of using these bigger platforms is they're kind of vetting themselves to the platform, not to the individual sponsor are not to the individual investor. So as an individual investor, if there are things that you don't like, you may not have the same access and they may not be as receptive to your feedback. Part of that is kind of the downside of the smaller minimum investments. It's kind of like if you can make buy a few shares of Coca-Cola, but if you show up at the uh, Coca-Cola annual meeting and you own you know $1,000 worth of Coke, your voice is not going to be heard the same as if you show up and you own 20% of the company. Well, kind of the same thing with these bigger sponsors and platforms. You can get it at a lower price, but you've got a smaller voice. Now, when you become comfortable with a, a specific syndicator, 
And if you're investing larger amounts with them or they have fewer sponsors, they care more about what each individual investor thinks about both their returns, the services, the education, all those things. And they're going to listen a little bit more to their smaller number of investors. And I can tell you a lot of small syndicators, they want to have a small number of investors because it's less work. If you have a deal and you're like, I need to raise some money and I reach out to my 20 investors and those 20 investors pretty much always fill my deal. I don't have to do the work of getting to know new people. So there's one of the advantages that smaller syndicators can stay smaller and decrease some of the total workload by having a smaller number of people to communicate with. Some of the, the cons, you know, people in the past, I think when some of these platforms were new, if the platform wasn't working well, and I, I speak of the technology, that might have been a concern. I think that's all ironed out. I guess the downside of platform performance is the performance of their evaluators. If the people bringing the deals, if you're trusting that they're bringing good deals and they're not fully vetting the deals or vetting them the same way you would, you lose kind of that benefit of having them look at it. Or once you reach a point that you've got your strict criteria, you may not get some of that same advantage out of the larger platform. Sometimes in these bigger ones, and this was maybe a problem a few years ago with crowded deals, you had to rush to get into the deal. I think everybody right now, after the interest rates changed, people are concerned about a recession. There's not as many people rushing in. And as we talked about before, it's a good time to call and talk to sponsors because their uh, relations people, investor relations people aren't as busy as they used to be. Um, so Looking now at the individual syndicators and, and some of the advantages and dis disadvantages there, uh, investors have an opportunity to be directly involved. They can speak with the sponsor a lot of the time with the person running the deal, not just an investor relations person. And they can have much closer communication with them and they can foster a personal relationship. Sometimes that's a, that for me is a big deal. If it's somebody that I know, and I trust, and I've worked with them before, and I like the way they run their deals, I don't need to have as much information from them because I'm basically trusting them. Any deal, no matter how well vetted, can have things go sideways. There is no 100%. But if it's somebody I know and trust that if things go bad, that they're going to handle it well, and they're going to have my interest in mind, that's a positive thing. And that's part of the relationship you can get with a with an individual syndicator. Um, sometimes individual syndicators will have tailored investment strategies to their individual investors. Uh, I know one of my mentors, his investors expect oversized returns. They like to see that, you know, if they're not getting 20% on their money, they're not happy. And so he doesn't bother with smaller deals or, or deals without the same returns because his investors don't want those. So it kind of narrows his focus down. Now, I, I have another mentor. He works in more stable, triple net corporate leases that are lower returns, but very stable returns. So again, he can focus right in his lane. And his investors all, he know he doesn't have to communicate with as many investors because his investors know what they're looking for and he knows what they're looking for. So they've kind of tailored to that exact thing. Um, and then the, the track record, once you know these guys, you know their track record and you don't have to do as much work as if you're picking people off of a platform. The cons, and we talked about a little bit, often higher minimum investments because you're trying to deal with a smaller number of investors, uh, diversification may be left. That's kind of the backside of the focus and uh, of the focus syndicator. The the focus syndicator allows you to kind of pick your what you want to get and and invest with that person. And it's kind of always the same thing. But if they're focused in one place and they're not investing all over, you get some of the same types of assets anyway. So you might not get as much diversification. One way around that is if you have several individual and in, uh, syndicators, and it may be just two or three that are all a little different, so that if if the economy changes, 
all of your investments are are stuck kind of going in in one direction off to the side, but you may have some over here in fast food and some over here in industrial, you know, or multifamily, and just be working with a few different people, but not having the same diversity of a platform. Um, you know, the administrative effort we we ta- I talked about a little bit just a minute ago, but it used to be smaller syndicators because. Um, they didn't have this giant operation, may be a little more administratively challenged because they didn't have the volume to streamline things. Technology has taken a lot of that away. The now the the platforms that are available to any syndicator at a lower cost allow you to have the online platform, allow you to see the documents that are posted on the platform. And because everything is done electronically, it's easier for the the accounting and all of those, uh, all of the paperwork and financials and all of that that's generated that doesn't have to be mailed out. It's just dropped on the platform. And that's going to be the same for a big operation or a little operation. And it's not a whole lot different keeping up with it. So now when we get on, I want to talk about evaluating your different syndicators or who you're investing with. And excuse me here while I'm just pulling up some different notes because I took a bunch of notes on this today to try and uh, get some more detail. I'm looking back at my some of my old notes on questions that I ask. And so I'm going to go through here. And this is, I don't know, hopefully I can make it a little bit exciting, but a little bit mundane from the standpoint of we're just going to go through a bunch of different questions. Um, these should end up getting posted in the, uh, show notes. So if you're not taking notes, uh, these things should be there for you to, to refer back to. So some of the questions about experience and track record, um, and in these, you could just ask them right this way. When you're talking to the syndicator, can you share some details about specific projects that you've led? Uh, or projects you've contributed to, including the property types, locations, and outcomes. Uh, what are some of the key challenges you face in those projects, and how were they overcome? How are you or your projects been perceived by industry, or have any of your projects won awards? Just showing that they're ones that communities like and people really like. And finally, can you provide any testimonials from previous investors or partners to speak to their competence? Now. This is one I always say, if somebody can't, I mean, almost anybody can get somebody to come and give a positive testimonial. It's not that hard. But if somebody doesn't have any positive testimonials, that's a tough one. That can be a tougher one to, uh, you know, why don't you have any positive testimonials? And for the positive testimonials, maybe even being able to talk to those people as referrals and say, what specific investment, what you do, and just make sure they're real testimonials. Uh, so some red flag answers. If when asking these questions to get these answers, these would be things that would make me say, mm, I don't know if I want to invest with this person. If they said, you know what, I don't have any specific project details or examples of past successes. Uh, and this is a concern about lack of uh, transparency and about trying to hide previous experiences or lack of experience. Now, not everybody can be the most experienced syndicator and if you're looking at somebody who's newer in the space, it doesn't mean that the deals are bad. But ideally, you would like them to have some partners in the deal that are more experienced. It's kind of like residency as a surgeon. You didn't just go out and start doing big, complex cases. You started doing these with somebody who was more of an expert, somebody with more experience. Not only were they showing you how to deal it, do it, but you were gaining experience working through the deal. So it's you know, and then as you do a hundred surgeries as a resident with somebody helping you, you develop that experience and that that muscle memory, that mental muscle memory. Um, so you want to see in a newer syndicator. Sometimes the newer syndicator has more uh, more motivation. They're trying to build something in this space, and they'll work really hard, and they really don't want to see a deal go bad because it's their whole reputation, their future. Where if somebody is on the back side, they may be less concerned, like, yeah, I've done a hundred deals that were great. If one doesn't work out, eh. you know, so, so not saying it always works out that way, but there's some of the things to think about. It's that newer person, if you're impressed with the person, 
and they just don't have the experience, just make sure they've got the people in their corner that have the experience. Um, some other red flag answers, you know, are, uh, you know, if they just say they prefer not to share those or it's not relevant, again, that just doesn't seem completely honest. Some green flag answers are answers that I like to hear with things like that. You know, is there like, uh, certainly let me provide you some information on some previous projects, their outcomes, lessons we learned. You know, how many do you want to see? Or is there anything specific I, I can get to you? Or, uh, you know, really that they're, they're willing to provide those concrete answers and they're willing to provide you most any documentation you look for. That's the answer you want off of all of those. Next area is their investment philosophy. And asking them, you know, how do you assess and categorize the different types of risk in your real estate investments? If they're not thinking about the risks, they're not thinking about how to mitigate the risks and what happens if the risks become real or, or things go, go not according to plan. Um, and this leads into what risk management strategies do you have in place for these unseen events? Um, how do you stay informed about how things may be changing in the market? And also, how do you keep your investors informed if things are changing in a deal or if you're having to implement some of your risk strategies? And again, can you provide any examples of how you had a risk strategy in place and when you needed it, how it was implemented? And also, if maybe if the plan didn't work, how did they react? It's always good to know how somebody reacts when things go bad. You know, things that you don't want to hear or we don't actively manage risk. We just kind of play it with our gut. Now, gut feelings, that's a lot of the time our, the gut feeling thing is misunderstood because, you know, we know now from neuroscience that, that our conscious mind is a small amount of our brain. And our subconscious mind is kind of the quantum computer brain that does a lot of processing in the background. So if somebody feels that, you know, talks about they had a gut feeling, they should be able to give an explanation of the gut feeling or maybe some of the things that may have gone into that gut feeling that doesn't mean it's something that's not a good answer. It just, it doesn't, it, that's kind of where experience pays off. It doesn't have to be something that was laid out on a good, bad, you know, checkoff list. Um, you know, this is kind of, again, going back to being a surgeon. If you have bleeding and you don't know where it's coming from, it's not always that somebody's going through it. You're going through a checklist in your mind going, it could be this vessel or this vessel or this organ. It, there, there's a picture that you see and where that blood's coming from, and depending on how much experience you have, you, you, as you get more experience, you kind of know, you're like, mm, that's bleeding down there, it's probably this, and it's not a stepwise thing. Or you may just look, and, and then you find it, and you know without thinking about it in the same detail. And I've had that where a less experienced surgeon goes, well, why did you look there? It was just bleeding from down below. And at first I'm like, I don't know why I bled, why, why I looked there. And then as you think about it, you're like, well, of, well, I looked there because in previous cases, when that started bleeding, it was this vessel, which in most people is right down here. And so without going through that whole detailed thought process, you just went there and you controlled the bleeding. So sometimes when you're talking to a syndicator, especially if it's a smaller syndicator, they may not have these well-scripted answers written out, but they should be willing to discuss their thought process with you there. And like, oh, we did this because, you know, of this previous experience. And so it's not always a bad thing if it's not a super scripted answer. At least for me, sometimes the super scripted answers there's, seem less genuine to me. Like they went through and they wrote these out waiting for you to call. Um, green flag answers that they have a risk assessment framework and that they've thought about some of the risks ahead of time coming into the deal so that if, if things happen, they've already generally got a plan to go that direction. Now, the plan, you know, this goes back, I think it was Patton who said, you know, no plan withstands the first shot of battle. That, you know, when you come in and you have a plan of this might happen, what happens doesn't always exactly fit into the plan. 
But if there's a plan that's got some general ideas, when it happens, it at least means you've thought out the contingencies and have somewhere to go with that. Again, I like to hear they have a plan, but at the same time, I don't want the answers to be so scripted that it sounds like somebody's just reading out of a playbook to me and they're not really thinking about it. If it's just an easy answer for them to to answer, then maybe ask for a little more detail and just see if it's an easy answer, just say, or see if their playbook is too scripted. Asking about market expertise, you know, ask about their relationship with professionals such as brokers, property managers, contractors. These are the type of things that help the plan get completely done. So if you're looking at a land entitlement or redevelopment deal, it's good to know a little bit about who's the engineer, who's the architect, who's taking care of the any you know legal matters, getting these things done, and what's their experience level? Have you worked with them before? If you haven't worked with them, why did you choose them? Um, and that there's a solid plan in place there. These other relationships, who are their partners? Like we talked about before, sometimes a deal isn't just one person. And it may be that there's a partnership put together for this deal that allows the whole deal to work. And sometimes that partnership may look like, you know, there, there's somebody out there who's good at searching for deals. And they're just, man, they, they drum it up. They, they find the deal. And, and then they kind of, they don't just ride along, but they take less of a leadership role because once then that deal is structured and financed. There may be another partner who takes care of that part that's really good at it. And then once it's done, the, the leasing out, the management or the relationship with leasing brokers might be another person in the partnership. And, and in some cases, there's somebody who can take care of all of that. But those are questions asked about who's doing what and how you got there and why they chose those investment strategies. Uh, so again, the positive answers are they can explain their relationships and why they have those relationships. Um, and if they don't have those relationships and it's all in-house, then then maybe ask for some information on the people who are responsible for each part of it and, and why those people were chosen. Another question is about deal sourcing. You know, how do you get your deals? Where do your deals come from? I don't think this one's that Im as, as, as important. I know people who are very successful who they just have broker relationships. Brokers hand them deals because the brokers know they can close on the deals. So they, they get great deal flow that way. Other people go out and they beat the bushes. They, you know, it's like, like the house flippers that, that we buy ugly houses. It's like we buy ugly warehouses. They go out and they actually talk to owners and they send out mailings and they look for off-market deals and that's kind of their niche. Other people, you know, may talk to business owners or have a relationship with the bank that they know that a business is moving. So there's lots of different ways to do that. How somebody sources those deals, I don't know if that's as much of a concern. Um, there's a lot of talk out there now about, oh, we have data-driven, you know, decisions and technology and all this, but it really comes down to it. Sometimes there are great deals that don't start out as great deals. And I'm going to give you a specific example because uh, this was one that uh, we discussed in, in my mastermind. And, and so there was a, it was an industrial property and it had a long-term lease. Somebody had signed like a 20 year lease on this property. And they'd signed this lease 10 years ago and they gave the tenant a great deal. There was a great deal 10 years ago. And at this point, you know, there's still 10 years left on this lease, 10 years ish, but it's leasing at a rate that's a fraction of the, the market rate. I mean, like less than half or like 20% of market rate. And so if you're looking at buying an industrial deal, the value of the building really comes down to the value of the income it can generate. So if, so if it's at a 30% rent compared to market, the building's worth 30% compared to market. And there were quite a few years left on the lease. It wasn't 10, but it was a little less. So it just seemed like something that, why would anybody want to own that? Because the, you know, the price it was at was more comparing to the price of comparable properties, not to the value of the lease. And so it just seemed like not a good deal. 
as the group dug into it, what really turned out was it turned out that the owner had passed away and now the family owned it. The family didn't really want it. They wanted to get rid of it. And the plan was, is it really went in and went to the leaser, the, the property, the people leasing the property had this great deal and basically said, hey, um, would you be willing to redo your lease or we could re-up and extend it another 20 years? Or uh, are there any things that you want, specific improvements that would uh, motivate you to, to bring your lease up to market rates? And so unlike renting an apartment, if somebody's got a great deal on an apartment, they don't have to move out. Typically, they're going to stay there. Um, but with a business owner, there may be things that they're more concerned about. And if their lease isn't a big part of their expenses, but there are things about it that are inhibiting their business, and then get those things built into a new lease, they may sign a new lease. And so the whole approach to this was all the data on this property, and this is where I'm talking about sometimes the data-driven decisions, said this was a horrible deal. But after digging into it, there was a pathway that was found to approach it that it could be a fabulous deal. And if this was not uh, humans looking at this and, and really bouncing ideas around, the great deal never would have been found in it. So additional questions on, on financials and returns. Uh, again, asking for a, a detailed breakdown of the fee structures, management fees, acquisition fees, asset management fees. Um, and this is when a lot, of, a lot of rookie investors or new investors get really worked up about fees and say, oh, their fee structure is too high. Or there, why are there so many fees? And and they and they get concerned that there's too many fees in there. The question about the fees is a lot of the time you're, and it's not always that way, but just always ask, what are you getting for those fees? So sometimes the fees are basically uh, what allows the syndicator to pay their bills, pays their employee salaries, pays their rent, their taxes, and allows them a little bit of a wage to live on. So this is their getting by everyday money. Um, and if they are in the deal with you, where if they make great money, you make great money, and they only make, and only if you make great money, do they make great money. And otherwise they make, you know, pretty mediocre money. Those can be deals that are set up. There's a little more fee structure. So they're making their, their baseline out of the fees, but then they share the upside with you. And there, and other times they'll have low fees, but the upside isn't shared as well. So again, in, in digging into the fee structure and again, how do they, and you can even ask, how do you align my success with your success and, and hear them talk about it? Because it could be part of the waterfall of how the money comes out of the deal. It could be part of the fee structure and a lot of the good syndicators they'll get excited about this because they get excited about giving their investors great returns. And, they, and they'll and they like to tell you about how, okay, this is what we're doing. And this is why it's going to be really good for you. Um, and we'll like to talk about that. Um, red flags are really if if they don't want to talk about the fee structure. You know, if I, I think anytime this just comes back to if people are, are evasive or if their philosophy on, on the fee structure and how funds flow through the deal doesn't drive with you, that's okay. Even if it's something that, that, that mixes well with somebody else, it may not be good for you. And some of those situations might be, if somebody's looking at investment as a fixed income, this is the money they're going to live off of in retirement, then they may want to know that they get their money up front. And, and that may be that, you know, you get your 10% pref, um, you know, bef before the syndicator makes any money and some may be set up that way, or there's very minimal fees before you get your monthly cash flow. Typically in that situation, you're going to give up some of the high end on the backside because now you're getting the, the preferred return and the predictability and they're going to get more risk because they don't get money up front. So they're going to want a little more reward on the backside. On the other hand, if you're a practicing surgeon in the middle of your career, you're making great money and you're investing for your retirement or your future to grow your net worth, you may not care as much about how the money flows out of the deal on the front side and more about what are the chances of the success of the whole deal? How much are you going to make on the, on the full turn of the deal? 
And so again, all the, the questions about fee structure to me come down to, you know, what's their philosophy on an understanding why they charge what they charge and how it benefits them and how it benefits you. Because ideally you're looking for a situation that that what they're trying to get out of the deal and what you're trying to get out of the deal mesh well and it becomes a a good partnership between the between the two of you. So those are are really, you know, the key ones for me. Um, for me, it's a lot about the people and asking, and, and I'd like to ask a little bit of why do, why do you do what you do? What do you get out of this? And if they're excited about what they do, and it has to do with that it provides them value in, in doing the job, they, they enjoy it, and it brings them some sort of personal reward. And they enjoy bringing personal reward to their investors. Um, I like those answers. Um, I like to know that, you know, because typically people who, are, who really enjoy what they do, do it better. If it's drudgery, they're maybe not going to do it as well. Now, sometimes people sound like old combustions, but they actually are, are very efficient at doing things. So I guess it's a little bit of finding somebody who meets your personality. And that as you have these discussions early on and, and you kind of work out your list of questions, write them down. Even today, technology is awesome. You can do a Zoom call with somebody, uh, especially if you're not meeting in person. If you're meeting in person, you know, you can take your notes and all that. And I'm sure there's some technology that could help you take notes in person. You just have a microphone, record it, and it'll, you can go back and, and the, the AI can spit out notes. Um, on, Zoom has as a function already that, that it can summarize a discussion. It can give you a, a transcript of the whole discussion. We can look back through it. And if you have more questions, you can ask them again. So I'd encourage you to use technology. Um, Use those things to capture your thoughts and what they're telling you and be able to review it. And uh, it's good to have sponsors. You can call a couple times if you need to, to make sure that you understand everything that was said about the deal. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's been great having you here and I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, please reach out. And we we'll look forward to seeing you again here on Surgeon Syndicate. This has been an episode of Surgeon Syndicate. If you got value from this episode, you know other surgeons are hungry to become job optional, and you can help them by sharing this content today. Schedule a call and we can make a plan. Looking forward to having you with me on the next episode.